pleasure to see you all. Okay, just a quick overview through slides and then we'll go in the Q&A. So just as a reminder, as a public company, I will be making forward-looking statements, so please do check our SEC filings. Okay, so I'm thrilled to talk about Adverum because we now are in a situation where we're well positioned for outrageous success. We've got three programs either in the clinic or near to the clinic. Uh, they're not so rare, and one of them's even over a million patients in the U.S. alone. Underlying this unbelievable pipeline, we've got science, and when you're in gene therapy or any leading edge science, it's critical that you have that kind of deep expertise in-house so that as things come up, you can quickly adapt and be flexible and modify. We have a good amount of cash to take our programs forward. In addition to the 191 million last reported, we just recently raised a net of 64 million. And we have a great leadership team in terms of development experience. I mean, just to brag, our chief medical officer has five approvals to her name. So really well positioned to have, be able to do a lot for patients. So a little bit more color around our pipeline. We have two liver-directed uh, rare disease assets. The alpha-1 any trypsin programs already in the clinic. We dosed our first patient at the end of last year. We also announced early this year that we successfully moved from the low dose to the mid dose. Uh, we've also talked about reporting the efficacy data or early signs, exploratory data, second half this year. Uh, hereditary angioedema, another uh, indication with uh, not so rare, about uh, six to 8,000 patients in the US, and we are planning to submit the IND second half this year. And wet age-related macular degeneration, again, huge indication, over a million patients. And we're completely thrilled to know that we have a product that works incredibly well in the non-human primate model. And the big news is with an intravitreal administration. And that's what's so stellar in terms of some of the uh, science that we have underlying our programs. In addition, uh, we are partnered with Editas and Regeneron, and I think that just speaks to our ability to do gene therapy in the eye, and we were the partner of choice when it came to their ability to deliver uh, products into the eye using gene therapy. I did wanted to highlight key uh, milestones this year. As I mentioned, we've already dosed and completed the first cohort for our advanced trial. We expect to report the preliminary data second half this year. Uh, wet AMD, not only do we have good data early on, but at ASGCT in May, we will talk about the data where you administer the vector, and over a year later, it still uh, protects the eye uh, against the neovascularization. And as I said, we plan to submit the IND later this year. And uh, for hereditary angioedema, we plan to submit later this year. So at the end of this year, we will have the early human data on A1AT and two additional INDs submitted. And these are not so rare indications. So I'll leave it at that. Great, thank you, Amber. Um, so uh, let's start with your A1AT uh, deficiency program. Uh, that, that's an indication where a number of companies have failed, um, but certainly the last few years of gene therapy have been typified by companies succeeding where others with older technologies have failed. So could you talk a little bit more about what's different about your program that increases the chances of success there? Sure, that's a great question, and I think the best way to address it is to show how it completely parallels hemophilia B. Because if you look at hemophilia B, the early work was done by intramuscular injection. So people were um, sticking into the muscle because the fear was that if you gave it systemically, potentially AV would be dangerous. And no surprise, the muscle is not a secretory organ, and uh, barely enough protein was detected, small amounts, less than 1%. The uh, field advanced, it was eventually administered systemically, and that was really, in some ways, a big launch to gene therapy when um, Amit Natwani published the data in New England Journal showing that when you could deliver it systemically, you got a fair amount of protein. 
It even went further, and as we know, Spark has the Padua variant, which Unicure then took on, and now we're seeing levels of protein that would be of benefit to patients. The reason I give that story is A1AT has taken a very similar path. So there was a program where the um, vector was administered in the muscle, so 40 injections were given into each thigh and 10 into each arm, which I think speaks to what a motivated patient population that is. Um, and there was protein, however, very low levels, very similar to what was seen in hemophilia. So now we're going back and delivering it systemically, and in normal people, the protein is secreted in the liver, and as we know, the liver is a very good secretory organ, and we also know that AAV always seems to find its way to the liver. So that's why we're so well positioned for success. And also when you look at our preclinical data and other programs where you translate from mouse data to human, and you can absolutely see that with one single administration, we should be able to dose escalate to uh, therapeutic levels. I think in addition, when I gave the analogy of the Padua variant, if for any reason we see protein in this uh, study, but not high enough, we can tweak the cassette the same way that in hemophilia you can uh, tweak the transgene. So I think that's where we're so excited, where we should be seeing the kind of success that these patients deserve. Great. Um, and then ADVM022 for wet AMD, that's a large market, um, as everyone knows. Just a quick prelude question. That's an unpartnered product. Is that right? Correct. All of these are, all of it upsides with us. So then Novartis uh, obviously was lurking in the AV-based gene therapy space with the Avexis acquisition. Um, so my question there is how disruptive um, is intravitreally delivered anti-VEGF AV-based gene therapy um, if the product works as expected? So what we're hearing is it's a complete game changer because right now there are good standard of care. I mean, we know there's Lucentis, there's Ilea, there's Avastin off-label, but we also know from very robust studies that patients can comply with a needle in the eye every month or every other month. So the fact that we would have a product that's administered identically to the current standard of care but doesn't have to be readministered that frequently and as I mentioned, we'll have the data on at least a year showing that there's no reason to see it go down over time. That's huge. And we don't, that's just not us. When we talk to the experts, when we talk to patients, there's huge excitement over having one intravitrally delivered dose and have it last for a really long time. I mean, that's hugely disruptive. I think as we learned when um, some of the Novartis ca data came out about quarterly administration, people were excited, but I think what we heard from the physicians was if I have a patient who is well controlled on the current standard of care, I'm not sure I would switch them. However, if it's a new patient, obviously I would love to give them quarterly instead of having them keep coming back. Um, I think in our case, it is such a big difference, and because it makes such a difference in long-term vision, because when patients don't comply, they do lose vision, I think that's where the huge game changer is. And then, I think it was in 2015, Avalanche, with their 101 program, uh, failed in WetAMD, and that was the predecessor company to Adverm, uh, and before your time as CEO. But what organizational lessons were learned um, from the 101 program, and, and why might your 022 program succeed where that one failed? Yeah, that was um, a completely different product from ADVM 022. Um, it was different in the sense that it was a different vector delivering the transgene. That vector needed to be administered with the surgical subretinal approach. And as we've learned uh, painfully, and others as well, when you deliver things surgically, there's not only additional risk, but there's huge variability because eyes, no two eyes are the same, and if an eye is perhaps less diseased than another, a surgeon may be reluctant to go as close because they don't want to do any harm. So it was a different vector. The one that we're using now was obtained through many years of directed evolution to specifically work when injected into the eye intravitrally. So it was a different vector. 
With that came a different round of administration. So the fact that we're delivering it intravitreally and we see protein in the vitreous as if you kept injecting ILEA is pretty exciting. The other thing is it's a different protein. So uh, we are actually delivering a Flibercept. And we know from the years and millions of patients worth of data on ILEA, it works. If you have enough of Flibercept in your eye, that is a molecule that works. So from that, perspective, it's completely different. So it's a different route of delivery, a different uh, serotype, a different transgene, and a different promoter. So we learned a lot. Um, sometimes you learn a lot more from failures and successes because you really leave no stone unturned to figure out what went wrong. And all of that learning went into how we're taking AVMO22 forward. So what AMD is a big market, they're, they're two $4 billion drugs on the global market. Um, so, you know, clearly there's, there's room for different companies. Um, I noticed that there are three, uh, at least three AV-based gene therapy companies going for uh, wet AMD treatments. However, um, Adverum is doing intravitreal while the other two are doing subretinal injection. Um, so w what is it about your program that enables you to go intravitreally an injection into the eye rather than a surgical procedure? Yeah, I think the uniqueness is in the vector. So we're using a variant of AV2 called AV7M8. And as I mentioned, this was obtained, we licensed it actually from UC Berkeley, where they had worked on it for years, doing directed evolution, and they kept screening and screening, looking for vectors that would make it through the inner limiting membrane with an intervitreal administration. And when you look at the data, like uh, green fluorescent data, when you administer other commonly used vectors intravitreally, and this one, it completely lights up, where the other ones you just see a little bit. So it's a completely, it's amazing how a variant can make that difference, but that's not new to the field where we see that kind of difference. So the real uh, different, a huge differentiator is this vector which we exclusively own, and I think that also goes back to my comments earlier why Regeneron and Editas were so eager to work with us when they were doing gene therapy in the eye because we seem to be unique in our ability to have vectors that work with an intravitreal administration. So that's a huge game changer in the field. So my final question, um, and, and this is one I've been asking a lot today, um, we're at an inflection point, it feels like, in cell and gene therapy. So um, from your perspective as the CEO of Adroom, what do you think investors are missing most about the space and about your company? Um, and you know, the, the, the question I'll ask as well is, have, have, have gene and cell therapies arrived? So first, because it's near to my heart, I'll talk about our company. And in that regard, um, we're completely undervalued. I mean, if you look at the way the bank analysts, they're not attributing any value right now to wet AMD, which obviously has a huge upside. And I get that, it's not in the clinic yet. We're submitting the IND second half. So there's very little value attributed to wet AMD. The preclinical data are phenomenal in a uh, gold standard model that the experts really have a lot of confidence in. So we're undervalued, and I think it's just, it's being missed now, and part of it has to do with that when you come out of a reverse merger with a big failure on Avalanche, it, it takes time to get the story out. So that's one huge value point that's being missed. I think the other is that if you look at the indications that we're going after, you can make a lot of money on them. I mean, if you look at hereditary angioedema, we don't have to face some of the reimbursement challenges that some of the others do, because patients are already being reimbursed at half a million a year, where they have to stick an IV in twice a week. So to have one single administration and protect them from potentially fatal attacks, you know, it, you don't have to think that hard to see that there's a way to make a lot of money here and make a huge difference in the lives of patients. So I think in terms of what's being missed is that while we're in rare diseases, they're not as rare as a lot of the others that have huge value, valuations. So I think that's what's being missed, and it really does talk to we're a huge value now because we're coming off of that reverse merger. So even though our stock is up almost 100% year to date, we still have a huge way to go. In terms of the field overall, I think we're getting out there. Um, it is, as we all know, on an uptick. We all owe a huge gratitude to uh, Novartis for 
putting the price tag on Avexis because I think it helps us all be seen that way. But you know, it's great to have a big player acknowledge that this is going to be a new mode to be able to treat patients and have a huge impact on their lives. Great, thank you, Amber.